A very good evening viewers. See clearing prelims examination is a mammoth task. But why worry when you have Shankaraya's academy? Our pre-storming program is aimed to facilitate this process. Pre-storming is the most reliable prelims test series offered by Shankaraya's academy. Already two batches are going on successfully. Now for those who have missed to enroll in these batches, a third chance is awaiting. Yes, pre-storming batch 3 is starting on November 9th. The first test in this batch will commence on 20th November. Like the other batches, it will also have 6 to 6 tests. So, go and register today to enhance your prelim scope. And with this note, let us get into Hindu Daily News Analysis for the date 4th of November 2022. Displayed here are the list of articles that we are going to discuss today. Without any delay, let's get into the article discussion. And today, we are going to start our discussion with this front page news article. It says that scientists from India have got the international patent for Cordy Gold Nanoparticles. See, these Cordy Gold Nanoparticles are derived from the synthesis of the extracts of the Cordyceps, Militaries and Gold Salts. And this is about the news article given here. See, even if you don't understand what I said right now, don't worry. We are going to discuss everything in detail in this discussion. Firstly, let us take Cordyceps Militaries. See, it is nothing but a variety of mushroom. And this particular Cordyceps Militaris is called as Super Mushroom for its huge medicinal properties. See, these mushrooms have a long tradition of usage as a natural raw material in traditional medicines. See, in traditional medicine, the tonic obtained from this mushroom is used to reduce fatigue and to stimulate the immune system. And due to the presence of huge reserves of biometabolites in them, these mushrooms are used as functional foods. Now you may wonder, what is metabolites? See, metabolites are the intermediate products produced during metabolism. And we all know what is metabolism, right? Metabolism is the process by which our body changes the food that we consume into energy. So, this mushroom, it has the presence of huge reserves of biometabolites. And that is exactly why they are used as functional foods. Now, you may have a doubt. What is this functional food? See, functional foods are foods that offer health benefits beyond their nutritional value. For example, take yogurt. It is a functional food. Yogurt has its nutrition which provides energy for us. And in addition to this, it is also a probiotic which aids in digestion. And likewise, just because it has huge reserves of biometabolites, this Cordyceps militaris super mushroom is also called as functional food. And this is about the Cordyceps militaris. Now let us see the simplified version of how the gold nanoparticles are synthesized from the Cordyceps militaris. We'll see the process step by step. See, first of all, the Cordyceps militaris, they are germinated in the lab from spores. Here, spores are like seeds of fungi. So, using the spores, Cordyceps militaris are germinated. And after they germinate, they are placed in the PDB medium to grow. See, PDB is nothing but potato dextrose broth. See, this PDB medium is a highly nutritious growth medium that is used for growing fungi in a laboratory setting. See, we all have done experiments using agar medium, right? Likewise, this PDB medium is a nutritious growth medium for growing fungi. And this is the second step. And then, through the process of centrifugation, the extracellular fluid of the fungi is separated. See, centrifugation is a process by which molecules having different densities are separated by spinning them in solution around an axis. Now, look at this image here. This is a centrifuge rotor. And using this, the extracellular liquid is separated from the biomass. And now, this extracellular fluid separated by the process of centrifugation is called a supernatant. See, this supernatant is then mixed with gold salts like tetrachlorate ion or gold tetrachloride and a buffer and it is placed for 20 hours. And after this only, the gold nanoparticle is formed. 
So this is the process through which gold nanoparticles are synthesized from the cordyceps militaris. See in the news article, the scientists said that they have perfected the biosynthesis of nano gold. And why is this such a big deal? To answer this question, you must first understand what are gold nanoparticles and the application of it. See, nanoparticles are those materials that are smaller than 100 nanometers. See, 1 nanometer is equal to 10 to the power of minus 9 meter. And the specialty about the nanoscale is that nanoscale materials have far larger surface area than the similar volumes of large scale materials. That is, the nanoparticles have huge surface area to volume ratio. To understand this, look at this image here. See, all these cubes have the same volume of 1 cubic meter. But as the cubes are subdivided, their surface area increases. The first cube has a surface area of 6 meter square and the last cube has a surface area of 24 meter square. And likewise, at the nano scale, the surface area will be very large. And as the surface area is huge, a greater amount of material can come into contact with the surrounding materials. And this increases the reactivity of any material at the nano scale. Now coming back, see the gold particles at nano scale are called gold nanoparticles. And they have a variety of applications associated with them. We'll see them one by one. In the field of medicine, the gold nanoparticles are used as drug carriers. They aid in the targeted delivery of drugs. And it is particularly used in cancer treatments. And why is this? See, sometimes the anti-cancer drugs destroy our body's healthy cells also. But using targeted drug delivery aided by the gold nanoparticles, we can prevent the destruction of our healthy cells. And in addition to this, due to its large surface area to volume, the gold nanoparticles can be coated with hundreds of molecules and this increases the potency of drug delivery. Secondly, gold nanoparticles are used in solar cell industry and research has found that gold nanoparticles absorb greater amounts of solar energy than the conventional bulk gold. So the solar cell manufacturers are planning to use gold nanoparticles to produce high efficiency solar panels. And after this, gold nanoparticles are found to be useful in electronics industry also. See, scientists, they have constructed a transistor known as nanoparticle organic memory field effect transistor, shortly referred as NOMFET. And scientists have constructed this transistor by using gold nanoparticles. See, these transistors find applications in rapidly growing fields of artificial intelligence and particularly in image processing and image recognition. Finally, the gold nanoparticles are also used in the field of diagnosis. The nanoparticles are used for the detection of biomarkers in our body that help in the identification of heart diseases, cancers and infectious agents. And now you know why it is such a big deal. See, due to all of these applications, the cheap and easy production of gold nanoparticles is necessary. And this is why the fungus-powered biosynthesized gold nanoparticles that we saw in the news article is a significant achievement. Now, that's all for this article discussion. In this article discussion, we saw about Cordyceps militaris, a super mushroom. And afterwards, we saw the process through which gold nanoparticles are synthesized from cordyceps militaris. And finally, we ended our discussion by seeing about the basics of nanoparticles and applications of gold nanoparticles. Now, with these points in mind, let us move on to the next article discussion. Now, for our next discussion, we are going to take this editorial article. It is about the recently held 20th Party Congress of Communist Party of China. Now in this context, let's learn about Communist Party of China and then the National Congress of Communist Party of China and then the outcomes of recently held Party Congress and its implications on the world and on India. But before that, the syllabus relevant to the article is highlighted here for your reference. Please go through it. First of all, let's have an idea about Communist Party of China and the Party Congress. 
See, political parties, they are an important component of modern day politics. As we know, the existence of political party is common to all forms of modern states. It includes democracy, socialist country, etc. But the nature of political parties and the party systems in a given country is determined by historical, political, economic, social and cultural conditions or the experience of that country in the past. So going by this, in democratic states there are two types of party system. Firstly, there is this two party system like in US, Britain. And secondly, there is this multi party system like in India, Switzerland. This is about the democratic states. Now in socialist states like the former Soviet Union, there is one party system. So in this one party system, a single ruling party dominates the whole political spectrum of the country. This is about the political parties and the nature of political parties with respect to different states. Now before moving further into the discussion, let us see some basics. We are going to see about socialism. See, socialism is a political and economic system in which property and the means of production are owned and controlled by the government. See, socialism is based on the idea that public ownership of resources and means of production leads to more equality. And this is about the socialism. And the countries that follow the idea of socialism are called as socialist countries. Now coming to China, see China is officially called as People's Republic of China. And we all know that it is a socialist country ruled by a single party that is the Communist Party of China. See the party was founded in the year 1921 with just 59 members. But today the party has nearly 90 million members and it governs the most populous country in the world. See, ever since the party seized power, it established the People's Republic of China in 1949. And from that period, it remains the sole ruling party that controls the country's government. See, the party does not only commands and controls the government, it also controls the media, army and other leading political institutions in the country. See, all of the points that we just saw, this is like an introduction to the points that we are going to discuss later. You should know what it is, right? And for that only, I am telling you all of this. Now, coming to the important thing, that is the National Party Congress. See, before moving any further, you should know one important fact. We saw that China is ruled by a single party, which is the Communist Party of China, right? And there are governing bodies for this party. See, the highest leading governing bodies of the Communist Party are National Party Congress and the Central Committee. Now, in this discussion, we are going to concentrate on National Party Congress. So, what is this National Party Congress? National Party Congress it is also called as the National Congress of Communist Party of China. It is abbreviated as NCCPC. And as we already saw, it is the most important political convention in the Chinese political system. Know that the Congress is held once every five years. And approximately 2,300 delegates representing all levels of party hierarchy across China will participate in the gathering. And they review the activities of the party since the previous Congress. And apart from this, they also lay down guidelines and policies for the coming five years. Now, this is about the National Party Congress. Now, we saw one another governing body of the Communist Party of China, right? It is the Central Committee. We are not going to discuss about that in this discussion. So, I have given here some points regarding Central Committee. Please go through it. Moving on, we'll see about the outcomes of the party's 20th Party Congress one by one. See, in the party's Congress, Xi Jinping was again appointed as president for an unprecedented third term. And Xi Jinping, he had placed his six strong allies into the powerful Politburo Standing Committee. Now, we'll take a quick detour here and see what is Politburo Standing Committee. See, the Political Bureau of Communist Party of China is shortly known as Politburo. It consists of a group of 25 senior most leaders of the party. It exercises the powers and functions of the Central Committee when it is not in session. And know that most Politburo members occupy leadership positions in the government and other state missionary at various levels. This is about the Politburo. 
Now coming to the Politburo Standing Committee. See, in the Politburo itself, the power is centralized in a subgroup called Politburo Standing Committee. It currently comprises of seven members who are the most powerful personalities in the Communist Party of China. And also know that each member of the Politburo Standing Committee has a rank, and they are responsible for a specific portfolio of the government. and hence the politburo standing committee is the most authoritative decision making body in the communist party of china and in the country as a whole see politburo it is a group of 25 senior most leaders and among this group itself power is centralized in a subgroup called politburo standing committee and it comprises of seven members Now coming back to the point that we discussed we saw that Xi Jinping had placed six strong allies into the powerful Politburo standing committee see this is done to tighten his hold over the party now this is one outcome secondly on economic policies of china the congress aimed to foster a world class business environment in china and the congress said that the world class business environment will be predominantly market oriented and law based and this is another outcome thirdly the congress also reiterated that china would continue to promote trade and investment liberalization while simultaneously working with the goal of achieving greater self reliance this is outcome number 3 fourthly The party's congress highlighted that China is always respecting the sovereignty and territorial integrity of all countries and it will continue to do that. But here safely it did not mention about the Russia's invasion of Ukraine and it didn't mention about the standoff with India. And this is one outcome. And fifthly the congress stressed that reunification of Taiwan with the People's Republic of China is the affair of China alone this means that China is rejecting the influence or mediation of any third country sixthly in the field of geopolitics the congress declared that the objective of the communist party of china is to effectively reduce the authority and power of the united states and this objective is to reduce the influence of united states in the indo pacific region see here china is explicitly saying that it wants to reduce the authority and power of united states how interesting no now after this in terms of china's world view the party's congress has reiterated its goal which is to make china a modern socialist power by the year 2035 and the party's congress also reiterated its goal to boost per capita income and to modernize the armed forces so these are china's goal in the coming years see already china is having a strong armed force now it aspires to modernize its armed force and this is one topic that is discussed in the party's congress and finally within the 100th anniversary of people's republic of china China is determined to lead the world in terms of composite national strength and international influence. See this is the long term goal of China. And these are some of the outcomes of the party's congress that is discussed in this editorial here. And from this what can we infer and what are the implications of this party's congress on the world and on India? See as we all know China is struggling continuously to take over the Taiwan region. and the 20th party's congress also stressed the same matter see usa it is supporting taiwan to retaliate the annexation efforts of china but what did we see in the outcomes of the party's congress we saw that the congress stressed that the reunification of taiwan with people's republic of china is affair of china alone so if usa continue to support taiwan to retaliate then there might be a risk of wider conflict between china and the usa this is first implication secondly the recent policies made in the congress had strived for restrictions on trade especially in the field of semiconductor technology see as we all know china is leading in the field of semiconductor technology so this would create inadequacy of semiconductors in the world and an indirect implication is that it will create economic problems in the countries which are in need of semiconductors and thirdly the policy is also aiming to modernize the armed forces and to develop more military assets 
So this indirectly means that China is actively participating in the weapons race and it will in a way lead to a cold war like situation. See these are the implications for the world. Now specifically coming to implications on India, see between India and China several thousand kilometers of land border is undefined. If they modernize their armed forces and they develop their military assets, this would escalate the tensions between the countries. Right? and this is one implication and then the outcome of 20th party congress had also reiterated china's action of maintaining strong hold in the indian ocean region we saw that party's congress stressed on reducing authority and power of united states in the indo pacific region so what does this mean it means that china wants a strong hold in the indian ocean region See this is also evident from the China's actions. See China is developing relationships with countries in the Indian Ocean region like Sri Lanka, Mauritius etc. Now take the recent example, Chinese vessel Yuan Wang Fai was docked at Hambantota, Sri Lanka. And India reported that the vessel had tried to spy on India's critical assets like the atomic power station, air bases and space station etc. So these type of actions by China will cause threat to the security of India. And this is the second implication. And thirdly, India is seen as a major recipient of western technologies. That too from countries like USA, UK and France. and this creates an image like india is trying to neglect china so china's aggressive economic policy like restricting the semiconductor technology will affect the economic progress of india so these are the implications of the party's national congress on india so what should india do india should be aware of all the goals and targets and economic policies and political policies of china and it should take necessary steps to strengthen its cause in the geopolitical forum at the same time it should also try and cultivate a friendly relationship with china so that there won't be any border problems or economic problems with china for india Now that's all regarding this article discussion. In this discussion, we saw about political parties and nature. We saw about socialism. We saw some basics about China's political system. And after that, we saw about the National Party Congress. And after that, we moved on to see about the outcomes of the Party Congress. And finally, we ended our discussion by seeing the implications of the Party's Congress on the world as well as India. Now, with these points in mind, let us move on to the next article discussion. Now see this image from the text and context article. This is about India's urbanization rate and employment patterns. So in this discussion we are going to cover the urbanization rate in India and the non-form employment. And finally we'll see how to relate these two factors. So this is what we are going to do in this discussion. First of all, what is urbanization? It is nothing but the population shift from rural to urban areas. and as a result of this shift large number of people become permanently concentrated in relatively small areas and these urban areas where the population shift happens is called as cities towns metropolitan areas etc now as a result of urbanization there will be a decrease in the proportion of people living in rural areas now you should ask yourself this question why is urbanization happening and why do people who are living in rural areas choose to move to urban areas see the main culprit here is industrialization see industrialization is nothing but a trend representing a shift from agricultural economy to non agricultural economy this means more industry is coming up so what will be the result of this with more industries more employment opportunities will be there and commercialization will also happen around the industrialized area see these are the reasons why people are moving to urban areas they are migrating with the hope that they'll get better social benefits and better employment opportunities and better standards of living now these are the reasons why urbanization is happening now know that this urbanization comes under the category of in migration Now with this information let us move on to the maps. Firstly, now see the image here. It includes map of the years 1991 and 
So, a comparison has been made between these two years. See, wherever the color is dark, it is indicating that there is more of urban population in that area. And the light colors are indicating a less share of urban population. See, there is a general increase in the urban population in 2011 when it is compared to 1991. And when we observe the 2011 map, we could see a pattern. And what is that pattern? See, urban population is high in southern, western and some parts of northern India. Whereas, when we see Uttar Pradesh and eastern India, which includes Bihar, Jharkhand and some parts of northeast India, the urban population is very less. And this is evident from the fact that eastern, northern and northeastern districts continue to have less than 5% urban population. See, this is a fact. You can use it in your mains answer. Now, when you take the south, except the districts of Idiki and Vayanad, other districts are having more urban population. Now, these are the inferences that we can make from these two maps. So, what are the inferences? When compared to the year 1991, urbanization has been increased in the year 2011. And the pattern of urbanization goes in this trend. Southern, Western and some parts of Northern India have high urban population. Eastern, Northeastern and some parts of Northern India have less urban population. Now this is about the urbanization. Now coming to non-form employment. See non-form work is nothing but any remunerative work outside one's own form. See it includes wage labor on other forms. Wage labor engaging in non-form work such as manufacturing activities, service industry or running non-form enterprises or businesses. I hope you have a better understanding of what is non-form employment. Now with this understanding, look at this map. See, this map shows the percentage share employed in non-form sector in the year 2013 to the total population of the district as per 2011 census. Here the green shades are indicating more share of population in non-form sector and as the shade turns lighter, it is indicating that there is less share of population in non-form sector. Now what can we observe from this map? See the share of population in non-form sector is higher along the coastal districts in Himachal Pradesh and in the northeast. Now when you take the UP, Bihar, Jharkhand, Madhya Pradesh and Rajasthan, they have much less share of population in the non-form sector. Now what can we infer from this map? This map shows that the population in coastal area are engaging in non-form activities compared to the central, western and the eastern parts of India. See with depressed form wages and rising unemployment and falling consumption, rural India has been hit very hard. And one way to address this is to make it easier for people who are dependent on agriculture to access more productive jobs in the non-farm sector from rural areas itself. See, initially, what did we see? What is the pull factor that makes the people migrate from rural area to urban area? It is the hope of better social security benefits and better employment opportunities, right? Now, if we provide more productive jobs in the non-farm sector in the rural areas itself, then this migration rate will decrease, right? And this will decrease the burden of the cities also. See, by doing this, we can avoid overcrowding of cities. So, what should the policy makers do? The policy makers should play an active role in encouraging rural non-farm diversification. See, this can be done by developing necessary infrastructure and by addressing structural features such as agroclimatic conditions in the policy decisions. Now, that's all regarding this article discussion. In this discussion, we saw about urbanization and we saw the maps of the years 1991 and 2011 and we made a comparison between the two and after that we saw about non-farm employment we saw what is it and we saw our map of the year 2013 and we inferred from that map now with these points in mind let us move on to the next article discussion now see this image here this image shows the members of Garo tribal community. See, the community, they are performing Mangala dance on the occasion of the Rising Sun Water Fest 2022. And it is celebrated on the banks of Umiyam Lake in Meghalaya. So, in this discussion, 
let us see about this rising sun water fest 2022 and then we'll also see about this garo tribal community and their wangala dance first of all let us see about the rising sun water fest see it is an event that is aimed at promoting the spirit of rowing and sailing among the youth of meghalaya see this is done to ensure that more champions emerge from the state of meghalaya in the water sporting disciplines and this year celebration has begun with the garo community's wangala dance performance and this is all you have to know about the rising sun water fest now let us see about the garo community and wangala dance see garos they constitute the majority in the east garo hills district and they are the second largest tribe in meghalaya after the kasis tribe know that garos refer themselves as achik mande and this means hill people here achik means white soil and mande means people okay and their language belongs to the bodo branch and other characteristics of this community include they are endogamous that is their marriage is within their own group as required by custom or law see among the garo community itself there is a difference take the garos of hills they practice slash and burn agriculture or otherwise called as zoom agriculture while the garos of the plains they practice wet rice agriculture okay do you know what is slash and burn cultivation if you don't know just look at this image here after they harvest they will just burn the field this is only slash and burn then what is about the wet rice agriculture see it is the cultivation of rice by planting on dry land transferring the seedlings to a flooded field and then draining the field before harvesting this is only wet rice agriculture and it involves three process planting on dry field transferring the seedlings to flooded field and draining before harvest now coming back to the characteristics of the garo society see it is entirely a casteless society can't believe it no it's true they are a casteless society and they are matrilineal it means inheritance is through the mother now apart from this they traditionally follow their own religion known as songserek and this religion has its roots in agriculture and after that saljong is another deity which is more closely concerned with the human affairs and saljong he is basically a sun god the source of all gifts to mankind and note that this saljong is honored with the wangala celebrations and another benign deity is chorabudi who is the protector of crops The first fruit of the fields are offered to him and he is also honored with a pig sacrifice. And this is about the characteristics of the Garo community. Now coming to Wangala dance. See if you want to know about Wangala dance, you have to know about the Wangala festival. It is the greatest festival among the Garo festivals. See this is like a celebration of thanksgiving after harvest. and during this festival only saljong is honored he is honored because he provides mankind with the nature's bounties and he also ensures their prosperity see for this festival there is no fixed date it varies from village to village but usually the wangala is celebrated in october a large quantity of food and rice beer must be prepared well ahead and the climax of the celebrations is the colorful wangala dance in which men and women take part in their best clothes see lines are formed by males and females separately and they dance to the rhythmic beat of drums and gongs and blowing of horns by males and this festival only is also called as 100 drums festival now that's all about this article discussion in this article discussion we saw about the rising sun water fest 2022 we saw some facts about the garo community and finally we ended our discussion by seeing about the wangala festival see all of these points they are very important from a cultural perspective so remember it and use it relevantly in your mains answer this will definitely help you fetch more marks in your mains now with these points in mind let us move on to the next article discussion now see this article here 
It speaks about the Indian Space Research Organization's RASAT-2 satellite, which was launched in the year 2009. See, ISRO has said that on October 30th, the RASAT-2 satellite had made an uncontrolled re-entry in the Indian Ocean. And ISRO also highlighted that the initial designed life of the satellite was four years. But due to proper maintenance of orbit, mission planning and economical usage of fuel, RASAT-2 provided very useful payload data for 13 years. And this is about the news article given here. Now in this discussion, let's learn about RASAT series and the applications of RASAT. First of all, let us see about the RASAT series of satellites. See, Radar Imaging Satellite. This is only abbreviated as RASAT. So, this radar imaging satellite is a series of Indian radar imaging reconnaissance satellites built by ISRO. Now, what is meant by radar imaging and reconnaissance? See, radar imaging is a concept that uses radar technology to take pictures. It works the same like a flash camera. As we all know, a flash camera sends out a pulse of light and records the light on the film that is reflected back at it through the camera lens. In the same way, radar uses its own light to illuminate an area on the ground and take a snapshot picture. But note that small differences are here when compared to normal camera. See, radar, it uses an antenna and digital computer tapes to record its images. But in camera, what did we see? We saw it uses components like lens and film. So, this is one difference. See, in a radar image, we can see only the light that was reflected back towards the radar antenna. We cannot see the clear image. But in camera, we can see the clear image that was captured. Now, this is about the radar imaging. Now, coming to the term reconnaissance, see, reconnaissance is the activity of getting information about an area for military purpose using soldiers, planes, drones, satellites, etc. So, RASAT uses these two concepts. One is radar imaging that uses its own light to illuminate an area on the ground and take snapshot picture and the other concept is reconnaissance so it uses satellite to get information about an area now coming back know that the previous indian observation satellites relied primarily on optical and spectral sensors which are hampered frequently by cloud cover so this is one drawback of the previous indian observation satellites See, there was no possibility of all weather surveillance because of this cloud cover. So, to overcome this problem only, the RISAT series of satellites were planned. And RISAT series are the first all-weather Earth observation satellites of ISRO. It provides all-weather surveillance using synthetic aperture radar that relies on radar imaging technology. See, initially, RISAT-1 was planned to launch. But after the 2008 Mumbai terrorist attacks, India was in immediate need of surveillance capability. But at that time, the indigenous technology that needed to develop the RISAT-1 was still on development. So, with the help of Israeli technology, in April 2009, ISRO launched RISAT-2. And this is the first of the RISAT series to reach the orbit. And this satellite enhanced India's capability for disaster management applications and also the country's surveillance capabilities. So, what do we know from this? We know that RISAT-2 is not an indigenous satellite. And then, only in 2012, ISRO launched the RISAT-1 and this was India's first indigenous all-weather radar imaging satellite. See, the other satellites in the series include RISAT-2B, RISAT-2B R1 and they were launched in the year 2019. And the RISAT-2B R2 and RISAT-1A, they were launched in November 2020 and February 2020 respectively. Now, these are some of the information regarding the RISAT program. Now, coming to the applications of it. Firstly, this RISAT satellite series, they are used for spot imaging. See, the satellite will be used for high resolution spot imaging of locations of interest. So, using this, we can easily find out terrorist locations, 
or wanted criminals location or even we can use it for wildlife protection so this is one application secondly the remote sensing applications of the rasat are used to monitor vegetation of a particular region and then in the field of agriculture they can be used to monitor the health of the crops and they can also be used in monitoring of forest soil moisture geological factors coastal regions and oceans so remote sensing is another application and thirdly the rasat provides tremendous support in the field of disaster management see during the time of exigencies the high resolution and all weather imaging capabilities could be utilized for search and rescue so this is another application and finally in the aspect of surveillance and security the all weather imaging capabilities could be utilized for border management and counter insurgency applications like i already said it helps us by providing views of terror camps bunkers etc now that's all about this news article in this discussion we saw about radar imaging satellite series rasat we saw about two concepts radar imaging and reconnaissance and after that we saw the satellites that were launched under the series and finally we ended our discussion by seeing some applications of the rasat series now with these points in mind let us move on to the next article discussion now take a look at this news article this news article talks about performance grading index so in this article discussion let us see about this index and some of the important points released under the report first of all what is this performance grading index see it is a tool to provide insights and data driven mechanisms on the performance and achievements of school education across all states and union territories so the index is grading the school education across various states and union territories see the prime objective of this index is to promote evidence based policy making and also it helps to highlight course correction to ensure quality education for all now coming to the most important fact this index was devised by department of school education and literacy under the ministry of education see as far as prelims is concerned we need this information only this performance grading index is released by ministry of education to be specific it is devised by department of school education and literacy and know that so far the department has released the performance grading index report for the year 2017 18 2018 19 and now for the year 2020 21 so this is about the basic information of performance grading index now coming to the indicators see the pgi that is the performance grading index it has a structure and this pgi structure comprises of 1000 points and this is across 70 indicators grouped into two categories one is the outcome category the other one is governance management and these categories are further divided into five domains they are learning outcomes and quality access infrastructure and facilities equity and governance process so this is about the pgi structure it comprises of 1000 points it has 70 indicators grouped into two categories outcomes governance management and they are further divided into five subdomains infrastructure and facilities learning outcomes and quality governance process access and equity and out of these five domains learning outcome access infrastructure and facilities and equity comes under the outcome category and governance process comes under the governance management category now just have a look at this table to know the weightage given to each and every domain see learning outcomes they have 180 points access 80 points infrastructure and facilities 150 points equity 230 points governance process 360 points and totally they comprise of 1000 points now what is done in this report 
See, the performance grading index 2020-21, it classified the states and union territories into 10 grades. For example, the highest achievable grade is level 1. And this level 1 is for states and union territories that are scoring more than 950 points out of the 1000 points. And the lowest grade is level 10 which is for score below 551 points. Now what is the need for this grades and scores? See the ultimate aim of the index is to help states and union territories to identify the gaps. Once they identify the gaps, the states and union territories will accordingly prioritize the areas for intervention and they can make sure that the school education system is robust at every level. And this is exactly why this index is devised by the Ministry of Education. Now with this basic understanding let us discuss about the performance grading index 2020-21 report. Now let us see who is the topper. Interesting no? Like in school states are also assigned grades here. But unfortunately there is no state in the top grade. See Gujarat, Rajasthan, Andhra Pradesh, Kerala, Punjab, Chandigarh and Maharashtra they were categorized under level 2. and the score they got range from 901 to 950 out of the total score of 1000 okay see out of the states that we saw just now gujarat rajasthan and andhra pradesh were newcomers that means these three states achieved level 2 for the first time now moving on in level 3 that is between a score of 851 to 900 a total of 12 states and union territories are found and this includes national capital territory of delhi tamil nadu karnataka and odisha now the third point and an important point is that no state was found in the bottom 3 grades it is commendable no it means that all states are performing good but it also needs certain tweaking for improvement now moving on see the newly formed union territory that is the ladakh has made significant improvement in performance grading index yes it has improved from level 8 to level 4 in the 2020 to 21 report this is appreciable because it is the highest ever improvement in a single year so these are the important points that you should know regarding the performance grading index report 2020 21 Now that's all for this article discussion. In this discussion we saw about the performance grading index, the need for it, the PGI structure, indicators and domains. And we also saw the weightage of the domains and after that we saw about the important points in the performance grading index 2020-21 report. Now with these points in mind let us move on to the next article discussion. Recently Information and Broadcasting Ministry cancelled the broadcasting license of Media One channel. See the IB ministry said its order was based on removal of security clearance to the channel by the Home Ministry. See the owners of Media One channel appealed against this order in Kerala High Court. But the Kerala High Court had upheld the ban based on the information provided to it on a sealed envelope by the central government. And since the information to the Kerala High Court was provided in a sealed envelope it was not made available for the media company or for the public so media one channel appealed against the high court order and the non disclosure of information passed down to the high court in a sealed cover in supreme court see this is the background of this news article and the supreme court judge said that the government should have at least shared the redacted document with the media one channel and this is about the news article given here in this context we are going to discuss about who has the authority to ban the tv channel in india and what is the procedure see it is the information and broadcasting ministry that has the authority to regulate the content Earlier the ministry had powers to regulate content in TV channels newspapers and magazines movies in theaters and on TV and the radio 
but after the information technology intermediary guidelines and digital media ethics code rules 2021 its power was extended to ott platforms like netflix hotstar etc See for the regulation of the content in TV channels and for the grievance redressal process the IB ministry established a three tier channel now we are going to see that three tier channel in level 1 we have self regulation by the publishers that is each TV channel must create a dedicated standards and practices department so if any viewer has any complaint regarding the content posted in the channel he or she can raise the complaint with the standards and practices department of that particular tv channel and this is the first step now coming to the second level in level 2 we have self regulation by self regulating bodies of the publishers see this is nothing but the broadcasting content complaints council it is a 13 member body including a supreme court judge who is a chairperson and the other 12 members are representatives of media companies see any appeal against to the order of the standards and practices department is made here so this is the second step the first one is snp department and the second one is broadcasting content compliance council now finally level 3 is an oversight mechanism by the central government and here is where the government is coming in See the oversight is done by the interdepartmental committee set up by the central government and this committee is headed by additional secretary of the IB ministry its members include representatives from union ministries of women and child development home affairs electronics and information technology external affairs defense and other experts appointed by the central government and here only the appeals against the orders of broadcasting content compliance council is made now this is the final step so what can we infer from this it is through this mechanism the ib ministry can remove the content from the channel the first step is standards and practice department the appeal against this one lies in the broadcasting content compliance council and the appeal against this lies with the interdepartmental committee Now you may ask so does this mean IB ministry can remove whatever content it wants no it is not like that like us even tv channels enjoy the right to freedom of speech and expression guaranteed by article 19 but article 19 of the constitution while protecting the freedom of speech it also lists certain reasonable restrictions See the restrictions include security of the state friendly relationship with foreign states public order decency and morality etc so based on this reasonable restriction only the ib ministry can ban a news channel so what does this mean it means that ib ministry should have valid reason for removing a content or banning a news channel see in the recent past the ministry has issued orders to temporarily ban news and other channels including a 48 hour ban on media 1 2 years ago along with asia net for their reporting of the delhi riots Now this is about the who has the authority to ban a news channel in India and what is the procedure. Now apart from this you should know that the IB ministry also has the electronic media monitoring cell. See this cell tracks the channels for any violations of the programming and advertising codes mentioned in the cable TV network rules 1994. and when a media channel violates the codes under cable tv network rules 1994 then the ib ministry might cancel the uplinking and downlinking license of the media broadcasting channels see uplinking is nothing but sending content to a satellite and downlinking means broadcasting to the viewers from satellite so this might be cancelled if a media channel violates the code under cable tv network rules 1994 Now this is all regarding this discussion. In this discussion we saw about who has the authority to ban a channel or content in India and what is the procedure. Now with these points in mind let us move on to the next part of the discussion that is the practice prelims question discussion. Today we have five questions for discussion. I'll solve four of them and one of them is a quiz question for you. Now let us take this first question. It is a previous year question which was asked in the year 2014. The question has asked like there is some concern regarding the nanoparticles of some chemical elements that are used by industry in the manufacture of various products. Why? Statement 
they can accumulate in the environment and contaminate water and soil see the statement is correct since the nanoparticles are stable and they do not easily disintegrate they can accumulate in the environment and they can contaminate water and soil also so statement 1 is correct statement 2 they can enter the food chains see once they accumulate in the environment and contaminate water and soil they can easily enter our food system see in our discussion about the golden nanoparticles we saw that nanoparticles have large surface area to volume ratio right so they get easily absorbed in our cell so the statement 2 is also correct statement 3 they can trigger the production of free radicals yes they can trigger the production of free radicals Here free radicals are atoms and molecules with unpaired electron and due to this free radicals are highly active so what is the correct answer to this question it is option D 1 2 and 3 now coming to the second question consider the following statements with respect world population prospects 2022 statement 1 world population prospects was released by united nations this statement is correct So it is released by Population Division of UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs, and it is published in a biennial cycle since 1951. So statement one is correct. Now coming to statement two, the population of older persons is decreasing both in numbers and as a share of total. See this statement is incorrect because the current 2022 report says that population of older persons is increasing both in numbers and as a share of total. So the correct answer to this question is option A one only. See I have given here some of the facts related to the world population prospects 2022 report. Pause the video and go through it. Now moving on to the third question. The question says that which among the following pairs are correct? One side festivals are given, on the other side the state in which it is celebrated is given. Pair one, Kail Poldu, Karnataka. Second pair, Sarhul, Jharkhand. Third pair, Nokram Dance Festival, Meghalaya. Fourth pair, Baisagu, Assam. See the correct answer to this question is option D. All four pairs. We'll see some facts about each of the festivals one by one. First one is Kail Poldu festival. It is celebrated in Kurg. The Kodavas they are a warrior tribe and this festival is held to worship their weapons. Now coming to Sarhul, this is the main festival of the tribal population of Jharkhand. See the verbal meaning of Sarhul is worship of Sal tree. Now coming to the third festival, Nokram Dance Festival. See it is a five day celebration by Kasi tribe of Meghalaya. See the festival is held to appease the goddess Kable Sinchar. See this is a harvest festival and it indicates the prosperity of Kasi people. Now coming to Baisagu, it is one of the important festivals of Bodo tribe of Assam. It marks the beginning of new year for the community and therefore celebrated in full fanfare. The ritual during this period involve worshiping of gods, ancestors, cows, dogs, ducks etc. And also the bagarumba dance is performed by the members of the community in full traditional attire. Now with these information let us move on to the next question. See this is a previous year question which was asked in the year 2019. For the measurement or estimation of which of the following are satellite images or remote sensing data used? Statement one: Chlorophyll content in the vegetation of a specific location. See, remote sensing satellites can detect healthy vegetation in agriculture. The chlorophyll in the leaves will reflect more light in the green and near infrared spectrum as compared to other colors. So, the reflected light will be captured by the satellite. So chlorophyll content in the vegetation of a specific location can be measured by remote sensing. So statement 1 is correct. And greenhouse gas emissions from rice paddies of a specific location. See this statement is also correct. See greenhouse gases from rice paddies of a specific location is measured based on the intensity of reflected sunlight. So this can also be measured. 
Now, thirdly, land surface temperatures of a specific location. See, this statement is also correct. Remote sensing data offers the possibility for measuring land surface temperature with the high resolution imaging technology. So, the correct answer to this question is option D, 1, 2 and 3. Now, moving on to the next question, which among the following pairs are correct? See, on one side, name of the index is given. On the other side, publisher is given. So, we have to find which pair is correct. Pair 1, Good Governance, Ministry of Home Affairs. Second pair, School Education Quality Index, Niti Ayog. Third pair, Action on Air Quality, Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change. See, the correct answer to this question is option A, only one pair. And what is that correct pair? See, it is the second pair. School Education Quality Index is published by Niti Ayog. Then who publishes Good Governance Index? It is the Ministry of Personal, Public Grievances and Pensions. And the Actions on Air Quality Index is published by United Nations Environment Programme, which is shortly referred as UNEP. Now, moving on to the final question. See, viewers, this is only the quiz question for you. Read the question carefully and post your answer in the comment section. Aspirants, I have given a mains question here for your practice. So, interested people, write it and post your answer in the comment section. And if you have any queries related to the articles that we discussed today, post that also in the comment section. And don't forget about the quiz question. And with this, we have come to the end of this particular video. If you find the video useful, like, share and comment and do subscribe to Shankar A's Academy's YouTube channel for further updates. Thank you.